So we are glad to see you here for this event. Um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I think I know everybody, but if I haven't met you, I'm Nancy Kennedy, director of Ollie at Furman, and we are thrilled that you are here for our um, second installment in the spring version of Upstate Cocktails with a Curator. We've got a great um, program tonight. And just if you haven't been with us before, a little bit of housekeeping, we are recording tonight. And so the best way for you to ask a question is to put it in the chat. Um, we've got the speaker spotlighted. So your pictures, even though you might see them on the screen are not being recorded. So we're protecting your privacy in that way. And because we have a pretty good sized group, um, the best way to ask the questions is in the chat. You can just put them in there as you think of them. And that way you haven't got to remember your question. That's always my problem. Um, and then at the end, after Tom's presentation, we'll have time for us. To, I'll, I'll ask him the questions that have come through. Um, also, if you haven't, I think looks like um, we have everybody muted, um, but just so we don't have any stray doorbells or dogs barking, make sure that you're muted during the presentation. So I would like to introduce our speaker. And I had the email pulled up and oh, there it is. Um, so Thomas Strange is the executive director and chief curator at the Sigel Music Museum here in Greenville. An accomplished builder and restorer of keyboard instruments, Strange has presented lectures, concerts, and papers on early piano development throughout the United States and Europe. In 2016, he and a small group of partners founded the Carolina Music Museum, which became the Sigel Music Museum in 2019, following a major gift from the Marlowe Sigel Estate. In addition to his work with early keyboard instruments, Thomas has an extensive background in material science and is the author of 55 patents and numerous papers over the last three decades covering all aspects of pacemaker development. So um, like so many of our Ollie members instructors, he has a very um, interesting and varied background and we are looking forward to hearing from him tonight. And Tom, I will hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Nancy. Uh, welcome everybody. So uh, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about this piano that's immediately behind me. But as you know, this is uh, uh, Cocktails with a Curator. And I have invited my wife, Deborah, to, Hi, to talk everybody. about a drink that I had selected. Uh, our piano that we're going to talk about tonight was made in 1834. And this drink, the Sazerac, was invented in 1834. And uh, both are still going strong today. So Deborah, quickly... <laughs> Show us how to make a Sazerac. Okay, um, when this drink was first made, can everyone hear me pretty well? Uh, the, uh, the original drink was made with cognac alone. Eventually when cognac became harder to find, uh, they began to use rye whiskey. Uh, a lot of times today they use cognac with a little rye whiskey. Uh, and then the, uh, the chief uh, couple of flavorings for this drink that give it the aromatics are absinthe and Peychaud's bitters. And this is a very traditional New Orleans drink. What you're gonna do is have two good chilled glasses. You're gonna pour in, oh, about a tablespoon of absinthe into each glass and you're just gonna swirl it around and then pour that out. And what you're just doing is coating the inside of that glass a bit. I'm not sure I don't have any water in here. We got then you're going to add, you can either add a sugar cube, or in this case, I'm going to use a little simple syrup, about a teaspoon. We have a paper cap here. Yeah. About a teaspoon. You're going to measure out uh, about half an ounce of the rye whiskey. 
just in a jigger, pour it in on top of the simple syrup, and then an ounce and a half of some good cognac. Again, into the same glass. And then I'm gonna add about five dashes of this Peshaw's bitters. And then take a spoon and just stir it around. And you wanna make sure that's good and cold. And then you're gonna strain it into that glass that you've coated with the absinthe. Better if you have a, a, a good strainer with this. Then take a little bit of lemon peel and just twist over. Tom, we've lost your sound. <laughs> Hi, Tom, can you hear me? We cannot hear you. I have now oh. unmuted. Did that work? There, yeah, I'm not sure what happened. We heard that till the very end, but that was great. And before you go any further, we already have a question about whether you can get absinthe in Greenville. You can. Yes, you can. Okay. Yes. So y'all enjoy. Uh, this is the best way to encounter old pianos is with <laughs> a, a fairly stiff drink in hand. All right. I am going to go to share screen and we're going to talk about, I think it's probably one of my favorite pianos uh, in the collection and uh, I title it a very southern New York piano and I think you'll find out why as we step through things. So just a second. So this is the piano in question. Uh, it was made by Robert Nunn's Clark and Company in New York uh, in the year 1834. Uh, they had come to America in uh, 1822 to 1823, kind of in several waves of, of uh, nuns coming in. And Robert and William uh, uh, began to work for a company called Dubose and Stoddart that had set up to sell music and musical instruments uh, in New York. And they were very, very successful at building these pianos and selling these pianos, uh, not only in the New York area, but uh, uh, particularly points down south. And part of the, the uh, charm was the design of this and some of the other instruments. So let's uh, just talk a little bit about what we're seeing here. So square pianos were invented and introduced in London uh, in 1766 by a fellow by the name of Zumpy. Uh, and they, they quickly became one of the most popular musical instruments that had been invented. And by 1775, uh, there were over 1,500 of these in London alone, and they were being brought over to America, the West Indies and Paris and so on. Uh, so important that uh, you know, here in America, we began in a very, very small way building such things as early as 1774. And then by 1834, they had grown substantially, but they're still much smaller than those late 19th century, what we call the square grand piano. So the square grand was sort of a specific thing uh, you know, made after 1851. A man by the name of John Dunham uh, had coined that phrase and uh, it caught on. And so today, anytime somebody sees even one of the little square pianos, uh, they instinctively tend to call it a square grand. But in fact, the square piano is rectangular. Uh, the Germans call it a table piano, and that seems to make more sense. Uh, but for some of these that, uh, that we're going to talk about today, uh, they're, they're sort of intermediate pianos, and they have a very interesting sound uh, that I'm going to try to share with you. So the piano that we're going to look at today is called a unichord, and that's a piano with one string per note. Now, your piano at home uh, typically has three strings on every note, 
and maybe only in the very, very low base would, uh, would you have anything else. Um, but in this particular piano, over the entire instrument, it's simply one string per note. And people were experimenting with that idea of unichords uh, since the early days of pianos, but it met with some real success uh, in the late 1820s to the uh, mid 1830s, from particularly from 1829 to 36, and particularly in the American South. Uh, the greatest proponent for this st style was the brothers Robert and William Nunns, who were later joined by John Clark, uh, and they all came from London to, to New York, and they became the largest export exporters of pianos to the South by 1830. And below there, you see uh, an image of the name board for this piano. So it's in this beautiful, uh, elaborate marquetry. It almost looks like uh, you know, a, an Art Nouveau sort of look. But uh, here we're seeing you know, this interesting pattern laid out in uh, satin wood, uh, you know, cut into the rosewood that they're using for the name board. So here in South Carolina, uh, wealthy planners would buy their furniture through distributors in Charleston in particular. Uh, the inland waterway uh, and the roads to the upcountry moved goods constantly. And for pianos, the largest music dealer in Charleston was Deming and Bulkley at 205 King Street. And our piano was sold through them in the spring of 1834. Later, there would be some other uh, uh, music dealers in Charleston who became even larger than Deming and Bulkley. But at this time, if you wanted a great piano, you probably were buying it through Deming and Bulkley. Uh, the little label below shows that uh, the, the silverfish have got a bit to it, but uh, I can still make out plenty and I know what the entire label said. So, so here we know that uh, uh, the piano uh, came through Deming and Bulkley Inside the piano is his signature where he has written his name to say that uh, he has selected this piano to go on to Charleston. And in one of those rare moments, because so much has been digitized uh, in the world, particularly newspaper uh, uh, notices, we have the newspaper notice for this piano that appeared uh, in the Charleston Courier. Uh, so the, it says the ware rooms of Deming and Bulkley at King Street uh, have a superior assortment of piano forts from New York and Boston. And from Boston, they would have had Chickering from New York. They would have had uh, Guybe and uh, the, the Nuns Brothers uh, offered uh, at the manufacturer's prices and warranted in every respect. Among these are some with a single string or unicorn pianofortes with the heart pedal. And the heart pedal is a little second pedal that puts a moderator strip in between the hammer and the string. Uh, on the nuns pianos, it's particularly thick. And so it really moderates the sound down to something that's, uh, that's quite uh, feeble. Um, years of experience has proved that they possess decided advantages over those with two strings having great power and with much sweetness and clearness of tone. Uh, in addition, uh, they're much more easily tuned. And this is the, the key part. They were more easily tuned, which renders them very desirable instruments to persons residing at a distance from cities or where good tuners are difficult to be found. And so that describes most of the planters, the, the, the wealthy uh, people in South Carolina uh, if you didn't live in Charleston, but you lived on one of the plantations, the truth was a piano tuner might be able to come through once a year. And if you're, if you're really enjoying your piano uh, and a unison goes out, meaning one of the two strings goes out of tune with the other string, um, then no matter what you do, that note always sounds bad. And so the whole piano can become effectively unusable until the piano tuner shows up. With a unicord, at least every note is, is true to itself. And so you'll know that that note will, will try to sound good. So who might this have gone to? Well, in this case, we know exactly who it went to. 
Uh, it went to this lady here, and her name was Eliza P. Lyles, born in 1816, lived until 1897. She was the daughter of Austin P., a wealthy planner in Fairfield County, and uh, she attended the Single Sister School in Salem, North Carolina, from 1829 to 1833, and, and she was an accomplished pianist and singer for her time, meaning that for, for home entertainment, I think that's what uh, they were talking about. Her home was Ivy Hall, uh, which is more of a large farmhouse sort of thing than what you think of as plantation homes or terra, but it's still a very, very big house and she had a big family. This portrait was made about 1840, the artist unknown. Um, uh, she received the piano as her 18th uh, birthday present and her wedding present in 1834 uh, and the piano was then passed down in the family and we know who it went to. It went to the youngest daughter Carrie and so here is Carrie in her nurse Betty's arms from a, a, a albumin photograph made in 1858 uh, when she's just a few months old and uh, so it was uh, inherited uh, by her, passed on to her son-in-law, Thomas Hicks of Greenville, uh, who, when he died, uh, everything went up for sale. I saw the piano and uh, I went ahead and bought it at an auction, uh, not knowing most of the history here. And uh, the, you know, as the history piled out, it became more and more interesting because the, the Pease, the Lyles, and this entire family you know, make up a lot of what the history of the middle of the state was like in the, in the middle of the 19th century. So if we were to look inside the piano, if you were here and I were, were to open the lid and you could have a look, this is what you'd see inside. Uh, it's laid out in this rectangular form. You see the strings uh, forming a diagonal across the, the length of the piano. That comb-like structure that's right in the middle are the dampers. And uh, so every time you strike a note, the damper lifts up, letting the note ring forward. And then when you let the key go or let the pedal down, the damper falls back down and mutes the note. Uh, to the right-hand side, you see something that looks like uh, uh, faux marble. Marble. It is, it is a, a cast iron plate uh, that has been introduced uh, just a couple of years earlier. And uh, the cast iron plate allows the soundboard to go the entire length of the piano and still hold the strings uh, in a meaningful way. And then they would uh, decorate it with this marble uh, texturing on it. And then that gold bar is a tension bar that was put on when it was made. And the whole thing built very, very robustly. So this is a really strong piano uh, and one that has held up very well. The family cared for this piano uh, uh, like it was you know, one of the family. Uh, and so it was passed down uh, literally in almost pristine condition. And so all the strings that you see there are original and all the hammerheads are original. So it allows us to sort of see and know this piano a little bit as though it were turned back to 1834. Now, as you guys know, I enjoy doing restorations and, and I, I did a little bit to regulate the action on this, but. I haven't actually restored this piano. This is what it looked like in 1834, and this is what it looks like today. Uh, it's one of those rare instances, almost a Rosetta Stone, where, where the family has been so kind and so good as to bring it forward, you know, in the embodiment that it had in 1834. So if I stop sharing, I am now should be back on screen with everybody. And uh, I'm gonna play just a little bit of this piano so that you can hear it. Uh, I'll tell you that it's a real good thing that uh, it's a unicord and all of that uh, discussion I had about the tuning uh, turns out to be good. Uh, the, the tuning pins on this are not a modern tuning pin at all. And remember I said it's all original. Uh, I have several tuning hammers, but I only have one that fits this piano. And I thought I had it with me today. And as it turned out, I did not have it with me today. So we're just a little out. And that's gonna give you an authentic 19th century moment where you're gonna be able to hear what this piano sounded like uh, when Eliza had it. So. Thank you. 
So the rest of the story is fairly interesting. Uh, Eliza had 13 children, 12 who lived to adulthood, and uh, two of her sons died during the war between the states. Uh, when the Sherman's troops came through Fairfield County in Febu late February of 1865, uh, they were there to essentially break the spirit and, and break the resolve of the South. And so when they entered the house, they would uh, do nefarious deeds, among which were, if you had something that was not a necessity for life, like a piano, uh, they, they'd uh, take it out in the yard and chop it up. Uh, apparently, when they came to Ivy Hall, they intended to do exactly that with this piano. Uh, but uh, Sarah Lyles, uh, uh, Eliza's nie young niece, was living with them and recounts the story that uh, they, were, uh, they were threatening to do this and Eliza begged to uh, play and sing for them one more time. Uh, after which, there was no more interest in chopping up the piano in the front yard. And so the piano was spared. And as you can imagine, uh, everybody breathed uh, quite a sigh of relief. And I think that's probably the, one of the chief reasons why uh, it was passed down and cared for quite as much as it was. So we now have a wonderful uh, South Carolina story to go with this New York piano. I hope you guys have found it interesting. And so it looks like it's about time for question and answer. Uh, Nancy, if, uh, if you have some questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, yeah, so as I said, if you have questions, put them in the chat. I'll start, I'll take um, privilege here and ask, how did you get interested in these pianos and, and this, this hobby? I, uh, it's probably more than a hobby. That's probably not the right word. Well, it, it was a hobby. Now it has grown somewhat more monstrous and, and, <laughs> yeah. and Frankenstein-like, but it's a wonderful thing. I uh, have a background in physics and in the physics uh, department, there was a professor with a, a little kit clavichord, uh, you know, back in the 1970s, building these little kit instruments was all the deal. And he built one and I fell in love with that sound. And I thought to myself, when I graduate, I wanna get back to that sound. And so uh, I did exactly that when I graduated, uh, I built a harpsichord. If you come to the museum, you will find that harpsichord in the lobby with a sign on it that says, play me. And you should do that. You should at least strike a, a note or strike a chord and enjoy the sound of the harpsichord. Uh, if you went to uh, hear the, the Greenville Symphony Orchestra recently, uh, when they did the uh, uh, Vivaldi, the, the Four Seasons, you heard that harpsichord uh, up on stage. And the reason being that it's the only harpsichord uh, in town that will go to A440. So that's why. Next question. Um, so tell us more about, you and I were chatting about the museum before everybody came on, but tell us more about the museum for those who've not visited before and what else they might see besides these pianos behind you. Well, we're here on uh, Heritage Green. So we are diagonal from the art museum, just across from the, the library and, and to the side of the Upcountry History Museum with the Children's Museum down on the corner. So uh, an easy place to find here in Greenville. And right now we're running uh, an exhibit called Sensational Sigil. And it's kind of the gems of the Marlowe Sigil collection. Um, Marlowe had one of the best private collections in the world. Uh, and he and I knew each other. We sometimes competed at auction and such. When Marlowe passed away, the family began to seek a home for all of those instruments where they could live together. And of course that was the, the real rub because most museums can't take an entire collection like this. It, it simply won't fit in with their storage and, and their strategic plan. So uh, we were young enough and we were small enough. And so we got the Sigil Collection and we are very proud to display it. We have instruments from 1575, uh, you know, all the way into the, the uh, early 20th century. And not only harpsichords and pianos and clavichords, but woodwinds that, that you need to come and see. Uh, the entire family of saxophones made by Adolf Sachs. Uh, the, the, the triple flagellate, 
uh, the glass flute, wonderful, wonderful thing. So do come and see us. We're a, a very affordable visit and I think everybody would have a good time. Other questions? Um, so here's a question, but, but I'm sorry, I'm hearing an echo. Um, here's a question about humidity must have been a problem on the farms and plantations as far as tuning. And so now that we have climate control in our, our houses, we're probably better off. Was that a, a big issue? Um, well, it was a big issue. And, and, it, and it takes us back to why this piano uh, you know, went to uh, Fairfield in the first place because they knew that it, it was, you know, it's south, middle of South Carolina. You know, guys, uh, if you've ever lived in Columbia, you know that you know, the, the devil, uh, the devil uh, has two properties. He owns Heck and he owns Columbia and he lives in Heck and he rents out Columbia. Now, I grew up there 39 years, guys, so I, I feel like I can talk a little bit about it. Yes, it gets hot, it gets humid, it gets cold and dry in the winter. And so, you know, we, we get everything. And these pianos were attempted to be made to be bulletproof, but certainly having a unicord solved at least half the problems of an out of tune piano. Oh, that's interesting. Um, next question, where would this $300 piano fit into the retail pianos available to the consumer in the 1830s? Was it the most expensive? Was it kind of in the middle? It was kind of in the middle. So the, the cheapest instrument that you could have bought at the time would have been just under $200. The most expensive instrument that you could have but, uh, bought would have been a, a large cabinet grand piano, which would have sold for nearly a thousand. Uh, only a very few people bought those. Most people bought pianos in that range of 250 to 400, maybe even $500. If you lived in Cincinnati and getting a piano was a hard thing to do, there were people also at this time, uh, Andrew Rouse was building then, and his pianos were $500, but he said, they're so much better than everybody else's. So, you know, you, you just kind of went with the hype and, 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 and bought one. <laughs> do, do you know what $300 would be in today's dollars? I... Uh, $300, uh, you know, accounting for inflation, would be, I think, something in the neighborhood of, uh, you know, ten thousand dollars. That so, was quite an investment, yeah. So it was uh, particularly, uh, you know, in, in a time when you know three hundred dollars would have bought uh, a full uh, field hand uh, through the slave trade. Uh, they they thought that uh, you know that was a, a, a pretty fair chunk of change. Um, when I was growing up, a friend of mine had, uh, I, I guess, a piano like this in her living room. It was the strange piano was what I thought. It was a shorter keyboard and all. And do you know how many of these are still around? Do we have any idea? Well, they, they keep popping out of the woodwork, uh, but I am archivist for uh, a database called the, the Klingscale uh, Early Piano Database. And so as these things show up, I usually uh, get them recorded and get them into the database. Uh, we have almost 9,000 pianos in that database that uh, are all the pianos up to 1860. And then we draw the line because after 1860, it's really a modern piano and we'll let, it, we'll let other people worry about uh, tracing that. You know, we do all the early pianos in that database. That's great. That's a lot more than I feared might still be around. Um, one last question. When were pianos first developed? Uh, they were first developed in 1700 by a fellow by the name, an Italian, by the name of Bartolomeo Cristofori. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, you can imagine a time when the piano was about twice as expensive as a harpsichord because of its complexity. There is no music written for it, and no one is trained to play the piano. They're all trained to play the organ or the harpsichord. And so, you know, for the average musician, it's like I could never afford it. There's no music written for it, and I'm not trained to play it. Thank you very much. And they moved on. So the uh, adoption of the piano was slow in the 18th century until the demands of the music for dynamics overwhelmed uh, all comers. And when John Zumpy invents that little cheap square piano that he begins to sell to everybody, you know, then it kind of makes the piano something that everybody's seen and everybody knows about and they all get excited. And by, the, by 1800, the last harpsichord is made in the classical period. And, and that's the end of that. 
Uh, I will say one thing. Uh, at an earlier lecture, I was asked, what is the chief risk to a piano? And with my curator hat on, I said, well, you know, water and, and fire and insects and, and such, but I was wrong. Let me tell you what the chief uh, problem is for a piano, the chief threat, and that is that it's gonna get thrown in the trash because, you know, we're, we're going through a little bit of a period now where, you know, we want things to be easy and we wanna simplify our life. And if it doesn't bring me joy in the next 20 seconds, it's out. And so, uh, you know, pianos are being thrown away at a uh, ex escalating rate. Well, that, think, I think we've reached the 530 limit. We, we have, I, that makes me sad to hear you say, but I play the piano and my children, maybe would tell you they suffered through piano lessons, but I think they secretly enjoyed them. Um, so I, I hope we are not throwing away too many pianos, but I have really enjoyed hearing about these and, um, learning how to make a Sazerac too. So we appreciate your time and um, thank you for joining us, Tom. Thank you very much. And it's great to see everybody next week. We will have uh, Charles Davis, who is Furman's first gentleman talking to us about renovations at the president's home. So um, we've got a nice variety of things this spring and we're glad you all joined us. It's great to see you have a great weekend. Thank, thank you. you. So much. Thank you.